Well, he's looking at fighting the, the sort of the mini Manny Pacquiao with uh, Nonito Donaire. Um, the, the, the tough thing about Rigo is that he basically, every boxer or writer that, that I've been around who's witnessed him just training says he's, they've never seen anything like what he can do. He has that kind of ability. And yet, none of that transcends to him being able to sell tickets particularly well. So in a, in a risk versus reward scenario with any of the top boxers out there, he's very, very difficult to match up because they're going to lose. And they're probably going to lose and not look good doing it. And Rigo's not really going to sell a lot of tickets. There isn't the fan base with the Miami Cubans the way there is with Puerto Ricans in New York or Mexicans in Los Angeles. So um, this will definitely help. This will definitely help this kind of victory. In the, and just, I mean, it's a tremendously exciting victory. I mean, if you watch it on YouTube, it's, it's him at his best. And um, so, I, I mean, they're going to push as much as they possibly can to keep getting him fights. And he's just going to have to keep winning and keep winning the way he did. But it's, it's going to be a challenge. There's no question. Now, is there any chance, uh, would it help his career at all to maybe move up 130-pound division, that type of thing? You know, we know Floyd Mayweather, he was around 130, kept moving up. I know his body structure is different than Rigo's, but has there been any talk about him moving up any weight classes? He could he could fluctuate probably within 12 pounds, up or down. Uh, he, he was eating McDonald's after the weigh-in. He drinks soda all the time. This guy has absolutely no care when it comes to weight. I, I really think he could move six or seven pounds lighter than he is, or he could go up 12 pounds. So, And that is absolutely something he's told me he intends to do. He wants to, to unify um, all the championships at, at several different weight classes. And, and he, he is inspired by Bernard Hopkins that he could be fighting until, until his 40s. And, I mean, uh, watching him train in Ireland last week, he, he looked better than I've ever seen him. His, his power, his speed, his balance, his timing, I mean, Boxers who are there, professional boxers watching him, are just mystified at his ability. It, it is really, really extraordinary. I, I've, I've been right in front of Manny Pacquiao training, and, and Freddie Roach told me that, that Guillermo had more talent than Pacquiao, and, and to my eyes, it's true. So I think the sky's the limit. It's just as long as he wants it, which is a big question mark. So I, I really hope he does and, and sort of puts his foot on the pedal. But... We'll, we'll have to see what happens. And, you know, of course, the 130-pound division in the past, uh, we've seen Morales, Pereira, Prince, that same. I mean, it, that can really capture the uh, boxing world. So if he can go there, put on the weight, eat the McDonald's, drink the soda, does what we have to do, it might be a really good thing for his career. I want you to talk a little about the uh, documentary. I know, uh, obviously, with the camera being stolen, there's there's a setback, but, uh, you've done some uh, amazing things. Some would even say crazy in Cuba itself. Kind of uh, how you made the film and are continuing to make it. So talk a little about that for our audience. I mean, the people should know that you're you're putting a, a bit of personal risk to, to make this movie. Well, to do, to do any of the work that I've done in Cuba, interviewing the top Olympic champions such as Sabone or Taylor Stevenson or Hector Vinet, uh the net is basically Rigo from 10 years ago, two-time Olympic champion, uh, just an extraordinary athlete, probably the best pound-for-pound fighter for about five or six years during his prime. Um, all of these interviews are conducted illegally. They're all frightened. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of risk. Where do you do it? Well, I, I was interviewing a lot of them at my apartment, uh, going to their houses. Um, you hire interpreters. All of these people tell you that, you know, on the lives of their family that there's real danger. And nobody knows exactly what the danger is because there's also a lot of paranoia. So, you know, it's a very hard thing to gauge what the risks are. I'm fortunate in that I'm completely desperate to get this film done because I've invested so much of my own money into it um, that I don't really have a choice. I just My only way out is for it to succeed. So I don't really worry about the threats and I just... Talk to who I have to, and whoever wants to work with me um, can, and whoever doesn't want to doesn't have to. But a lot of these people, you know, Felix Sabone turned down a $100 million career to be a pro, and yet they'll take $100 off me at the end of an interview. So you have to deal with a lot of these kind of contradictions, and just what I try to do is just not judge it. I think he's telling the truth when he turned a $100 million down. I think he's telling the truth when he's very comfortable accepting $100 off me. 
to talk with him for 75 minutes on camera. But it's it's a strange scene, man. Like, I'm, I'm going back there in a few weeks for another month, and I never know if I'll be able to get back into the country. I never know um, while I'm there if somebody's going to arrest me and, and take me to the airport. Um, a lot of the works that I really admire that have been written about Cuba, by especially by American writers, they've never been permitted back. So it is a risk, because I love that country, and I, it would break my heart to never be able to go back. And I'm not trying to criticize their system or even the American system. I'm just trying to look at, um, you know, how does somebody turn down $100 million? That's an interesting phenomena, and I'd rather see it not as that he's brainwashed, but maybe he has some principles that are involved. And, and I found, I just found something very special. And, and I think by the end of this thing, people will hopefully find something special in, in the work I've been trying to do. You know, the irony of all of this, I'd have to say, is you have a better understanding and can relate to the Cuban people because of the desperation, because of the fear of the government, all the restrictions. You have a really good understanding of what Cubans have to go through on a day-to-day basis. Well, that's true. It, it, it's a big threat. You know, I to try and gauge that paranoia, my first thing is, you know, there's, there's a uniformed cop every couple blocks in Havana, but... I ask the citizens very often to see how paranoid they are. How many secret police do you think there are? And you'll get some people who say, well, it's probably seven secret police to every one uniform police. Another person will say, well, it's two to one. Or anybody who lives on your street could be an informer to the police, which is another big threat for these interviews that I'm conducting because not all the people I'm interviewing are former champions. Some of them are champions to come who are children of Olympic champs and, and are going to be the next Regondos and, and the next people coming down the pipe to try and get to the United States. And some of these people have gone on camera telling me that they want to leave, which, which is frightening because I'm not there to facilitate anything that they're doing in terms of staying or leaving. It, that's not my agenda at all. I'm just trying to just let them speak for themselves. But just having a, a document of them saying they want to leave, it could end these people's lives professionally and impact their family. And ethically, that's a tough position to be in when there's a lot about Cuba that I I think there is a lot of integrity to to many aspects of that culture that do not exist in America. And likewise, I think there's a lot of integrity in the American system that exposes the hypocrisy of the Cuban system. But it's just difficult when you're really playing with people's lives just, just by having them speak with you openly about how they feel about what they want to do with the rest of their lives. So um, you talked about that. The I mean, that's just some crazy stuff. Is um, the feeling in Cuba, hey, Castro's almost done living, and then we'll kind of have a, more of a normal life? Or, or is the feeling, hey, Castro's maintained order, and we want him to live as long as possible? Or what do you get on the streets? What type of vibe? Well, I think the general attitude of Cubans towards Fidel Castro is they respect his values. What they want is more money. They want to be able to have a better life, but they do respect the values of the Cuban Revolution. I mean, even the term defectors, I think, is a misnomer in many cases because we don't refer to Mexicans who enter California as defectors, and we don't refer to Filipinos who come to America to to work as defectors. We say they're, they're searching for opportunity. Most Cubans who seek out opportunity in the United States definitely want to go back to Cuba. So the defecting, the defector um, appellation is a loaded term that's always used by the American media. And I don't think it's necessarily appropriate because, I mean, I think the difficulty a lot of people have with why Cuba doesn't topple, like how can people survive in this kind of system, is it is a homegrown revolution. It's not somebody who just swept into power and and it's one bad guy who's controlling everything. A lot of people believe in this revolution. A lot of people risked everything they had for it and, and, you know, definitely tried to sell it to their kids. But at the same time, I do think with the interviews I've had with the, the young boxers who are coming up, there's a new generation on the way that has absolutely no interest or investment in what the sacrifices were of their parents or their grandparents. And that kind of is where my film is going as well, is where these boxers are going in terms of the ones who chose to stay, the ones who really had to struggle about whether they were going to leave or stay, and now the next generation, which basically with the shrug of the shoulders is saying, get me out of this place. 
you know, I want what's best for me. And that's a big shift because the, the star of the Cuban boxing system has always been the system itself to produce champions. And now some of those boxers, just like Reagan Yao himself, is, don't I deserve more being a two-time Olympic champion for my sacrifice than regular Cuban? And that's quite a, quite a thing. To, to, to say, because everybody's sacrificing over there for kind of a common good. So it's, it's a very challenging thing, because I think there's a lot of guilt on rigging the out shoulders for leaving. I mean, how much money is it worth to not be with your mother when she's dead, or not to be with your wife and child? So there's this kind of Judas angle to, to what he's done, because the system found him, the system nurtured him and developed him, and would he have been able to become a champion in, in America? He doesn't know. And, and I'm not sure either. The resources weren't there to be allocated into somebody like him coming from such a rural, poor background. So it's, it's very iffy. So I think that's a real conflict inside of him is he is a product of that system. He, he's the product of that system. And, and yet he turns his back on that country and, and is deemed a traitor officially. But yet a lot of the citizens really back what he did because they think he does deserve more and they think they deserve more as well. So it's very, very complicated. I, you know, I, I could talk about this for hours, but I don't want to bore you. 